Ani bojau kinawaya gita gabajuna denawema kina gachina shnabek ogaming na donjaba negojawani megwado da vidas musa kena dajna kas. My name is Leanne Simpson, and I'm very happy to be here uh, with you today at NASA North Virtual. Um, I am a faculty member at the Dachinta Center for Research and Learning. Um, I'm also a, a writer and an academic and a musician, and I'm so honored to be joined today by Dr. Jessica Bissett Perea, who is a Dene Aina um, and is an interdisciplinary musician, scholar, whose indigenous led and indigeneity centered work advances radical and relational ways of being, knowing, and doing to generate more just futures for Indigenous communities. Dr. Bissett is an associate professor and graduate advisor in the Department of Native American Studies at the University of California, Davis. And she is joining us today to talk about her new book, which is called Sound Relations, Native Ways of Doing Music History in Alaska, and was published by Oxford University Press in November 2021. So uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Bissett, and I'll pass things over to you now. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Simpson. It's a pleasure to be here, and what I'll go ahead and do is share my screen and launch into uh, a little bit of background information and a more full introduction um, that I've gotten into the habit of doing, certainly via Zoom uh, in these new technological times, um, but just to give some more background on who I am and where I'm from and, and why that matters. So um, basically how I've come since the book has been published and how I've come to think about it being in the world now is, really wanting to emphasize this idea of listening for the density of relationality. And, and I'll end um, my, my kind of brief introduction of the book uh, with that, um, with this idea. But uh, I want to kind of proceed in three parts. Uh, the first being um, introductions as invitation, um, a couple of indigeneity questions that animate my work. Uh, and then we'll end with kind of um, a discussion of one of the models that shows up in the book in the fourth chapter, Sound Relations Model. And throughout, and, and definitely in my research and teaching, I've come to think of kind of these three realms, uh, and I'll speak about them as uh, ontologies or people's ways of being, epistemologies, places or ways of knowing, and then projects, methodologies, ways of doing. And, and the the how of, of what it is that we do as, as researchers is really important to me. And certainly um, in the transition I made from being trained in music studies to now having been in Native American and Indigenous studies for the past decade um, has really taken on a very different meaning and, and more important, urgent meaning. Uh, so without further ado, I'll take a moment just to more fully introduce myself. And Yale Du, Jessica Bissett Prayash E. Kuyan. Dana Dekishna Ishlan Shida. Kanakatna Ishlan Shida. Kanakatnu Shugu Shagayak Kilanda. Sheldina Rile Te Ana Ishlan Shida. Nolchina Ishlan Shida. Umkoya shata anik nikolai shugure latin. Shita a Virginia colors shugure latin. Phyllis dao shita a John Platt shata a ki rilana. Shungta Deborah Platt in Manik Udi. Shadesh naka etzi dine eshlan shida. Mary Burkholder, Shita'a, Kenneth Bissett, Shata'a, Relana. Shtukta Ronald Bissett, in Lanink Uri. Shkizlan, Reyatnu. Shumta Shtukta Alanite, Shugu, Kotan, Ratna, Reluda. Hallie Staja, Rachel Staja. John Carlos Preishken, Josephine Staa, Jacob Shea, 
Chutchone Oloni Athlena Huchin, Shukuya Studa Patwan Athlena Puta Toy, Ka Shukuya Studa Chenan Hesh Keshashnu Dana Inak Dudeli Shi. Um, I usually, uh, when giving these presentations in person, will take a moment, and as I will here, to point out that um, I am, in fact, uh, took some people learned how to make sourdough bread over the pandemic. I learned how to introduce myself in Nanaina, and to me, that's um, becoming increasingly important as well because it's been recently reported that there's only five um, fluent speakers of our language left, and so whenever I get the chance, I take it to. Uh, sound the language and then its relationships to those images that I've shared in terms of my my own upbringing and family. So if the first two decades of my life um, are framed in that way, uh, the places and spaces that I move through um, that inform the book and, and how it came into being is what this next section will be. So the kinds of logics and analytics that I've um, developed over the last the last two decades. <laughs> and so my academic pursuits have led me from Denana Atlena, my ancestral homelands, to Coast Salish lands currently occupied by Edmonds Community College, where I earned a general transfer degree and performed with the semi-professional vocal jazz ensemble, to Yakima lands currently occupied by Central Washington University, where I earned a bachelor's degree in music education with an emphasis in jazz education and double bass performance, to Numu Nue and Washishu lands currently occupied by the University of Nevada, Reno, where I earned a Master of Arts degree in music history and founded and directed the department's vocal jazz ensemble program. To Gabrielle and Tongva lands, currently occupied by the University of California, Los Angeles, where I earned a PhD in musicology with a dissertation titled The Politics of Inuit Musical Modernities in Alaska. I work on Putwin lands, currently occupied by the University of California, Davis where I am an associate professor and graduate advisor in the Department of Native American Studies. Um, it's always also important to me to, to take a moment to acknowledge um, this, the, I guess, a couple of handfuls of Native American peoples who have earned music research degrees. Um, to this date, there's only 16 of us. There's one in our fourth generation now um, who will be uh, thankfully studying with me next year as a postdoctoral scholar. But, for the first and second generations who earned their degrees in the 70s and the 90s, um, it, it, I, I can only imagine the, the ideas of sound as presence or absence and silence very much occupy a lot of my thinking and, and the kind of impetus behind uh, the many case studies that appear in the book. Um, it, but the, the point of also kind of recognizing the folks that not only paved the way for the third generation that I'm a part of, to be part of musicology or ethnomusicology is important, but to think about the kinds of work that we are actively doing together in different formats and publishing and presenting and mentoring um, the next generation. And so part of one of the arguments I make in the introduction of the book is this idea of wanting to bring into being a more sounded uh, indigenous studies, but also a more indigenous music studies. And that's where a lot of my time uh, academically the last two decades have been spent is really trying to grapple with <laughs> how do you do that um, to varying degrees of success. I'm very fortunate to work with uh, nine advisees in my, the Department of Native Studies at Davis, um, some of whom are actively involved in indigenizing music studies, um, but others are also doing important work of uh, rematriating stolen children from uh, boarding school graveyards on the East Coast back to Alaska to uh, telling uh, indigenous feminist uh, stories of Dene weaving and, and many other important projects. So it's just a, a thrill to not only continue the work of those who have earned PhDs in music studies before me, before me, but to also encourage the next generation. In terms of some of the projects um, that I'm involved in right now that um, are also stemming out of the book. Um, there's this project I've been working on the last two years with uh, fa faculty from uh, Ilse Matusarfik, Halali Inat, colleagues from the University of Greenland, thinking about performance methodologies in food sovereignty movements, um, working with colleagues at UC Davis in food science and technology. So really thinking about the broader multisensorial um, aspects of, of indigenous uh, life and life ways. Um, also branching out to the Asia Pacific uh, 
Indigenous Studies Seminar that I'm, we're currently doing right now with the University of Malaya with partnerships there, um, but also with colleagues who are part of the third generation and, and other folks who earn degrees in different disciplines working together on an interdisciplinary edited collection uh, that we're titling Sovereign Aesthetics, Indigenous Approaches to Sound Studies. So these are some of the things that are have been in, in the works uh, in proximity to the book and beginning as a keywords for Indigenous sound studies um, back in 2017. So at its core, the book really argues for Native musicking to be understood as a project, as an action that amplifies the density of our Indigenous being as Indigenous peoples and densities, as I'll explain, um, comes from how Métis scholar Chris Anderson has theorized this in relation to institutionalization of Native studies in the academy and this idea of, of making more space to understand the many different ways, not only um, that we can be and know and act indigenously, but um, I wanted to really emphasize that in terms of uh, Alaska Native uh, peoples and places and projects. I also want to um, reiterate what many of my colleagues in sound studies and music studies are saying, that, that music and sounds our knowledge is as rooted in lands, waters, and sacred places. And then thirdly, that sound and music are integral to self-determination movements and resurgence projects. And some of the indigeneity questions that um, I'm primarily asking of music and sound studies um, are very much informed from uh, work done uh, by uh, First Nation scholars, such as uh, Cree scholar Greg Youngings, uh, indigenous elements of indigenous style and thinking about the how we write um, the conventions of, of writing and publishing in Native American and Indigenous studies is very um, interesting and important to me. And so this idea that has been raised in American studies contexts, um, both by scholars of, of Black and African American histories, and then later by um, Sherry Hundorf and thinking about putting Native studies at the center of American studies as a broader field, what we wanted to do um, with some colleagues in music studies was to really think clearly and closely about what happens to American music and sound studies in America understood as hemispheric if you put indigeneity at its center. And um, this is a, a question that I, I center uh, Alaska more specifically in the book, right? But in thinking about, um, you know, asking indigeneity questions of a field that has not paid uh, proper attention to uh, indigenous ways of being, knowing, and doing, we have to rethink what the purpose of American music and sound studies is. What are the terms of engagement um, at use? Whose ways of knowing and doing are prioritized? And how might we better uplift the density of indigenous beings within this field? And more broadly then, you know, how can music and sound studies research do work with by and for trans, queer, and two-spirit and indigenous black and peoples of color communities um, as some of the ways that that non-white, uh, more than white communities have been um, articulated and more than um, heteronormative. And these are, these are the communities that my colleagues and my students and I are primarily um, working with. Um, these could obviously be placed, uh, replaced with any number of different communities or, or projects that other folks are interested in. But this idea of doing work uh, is the important factor here. And one way we say we can argue that is that we need to value um, trans, queer, two-spirit, and indigenous, black, and peoples of color ontologies and epistemologies as sounding methodologies. They are music as history and genealogy, music as law, medicine, science, religion, environmental policy, management, pedagogy, and more. Um, that usually, in, especially in the academy, we want to think that we can silo these things and separate them, that music is not related to medicine, that music is not related to um, education, but we, we know differently, obviously, in Native American Indigenous Studies. Um, as I mentioned, the idea of presence and silence um, preoccupies me a lot as someone uh, from the Arctic and subarctic regions. This is just a Google litmus test that I'd like to do that I think about a lot, and obviously that also informs the work in the book, uh, in terms of thinking about the North as unpeopled, that there's a lot of conservation work done for both um, animals, especially polar bears, which you see a lot on the screen, um, but also um, people's attention to climate change, which of course is a very urgent and, and threatening issue. 
but often, um, as one of my colleagues in my department has said in, in previous conversations, Beth Rose Middleton Manning, in conversation with conservationists, can we conserve on stolen land? Um, the question would also be, uh, can we do music studies and musicology on stolen land? And that that acknowledgement and that that grappling with the truth of of the North as people that is densely populated, actually, um, is is one that um, gets erased when we think about this this kind of um, popular imagination of of who is in and what is in the North. And this map of Alaska native language areas is one that I like to show, knowing full well that linguistic maps have, have their issues. This is supposedly a representation of cultural and linguistic areas around 1900. But I show it um, because folks are often shocked to learn um, that there are people other than quote unquote Eskimos in Alaska. And this, I imagine, is very much something that all of us above the 49th parallel across uh, what is now known as Canada um, grapples with as well. And this idea that um, the, the density of not only languages, but then leading into the density of peoples in the United States context, at least, this is just some census data from 2016. And the point here is where I work now in California, and when I've done talks on the East Coast, for example, this idea of density, um, like literal density, population density, is one that is often um, difficult to imagine, but that in Alaska, you're in most contexts, you're going to meet at least one in five, if not more, people who identify as uh, Alaska Native. And so this, the ideas of um, peoplehood and peopling, uh, density and presence, uh, are just things that I I don't I don't think I could say I took for granted, but it's something that is is really unique to the North. And um, I would I would love to talk more about that uh, with anybody who would like to um, afterward. But again, the point of the book and the point of all of my work is just to try to bring a more relational music and sound studies rather than comparative, which is usually an anthropological um, leaning, right? To compare and those comparisons usually being based in hierarchical understandings of some cultures being more superior than others. And that's, that's not the case. And so um, in terms of thinking about the sound relations model, these are some albums that uh, are featured of the musicians and musics featured in the book. Um, and I just, I love <laughs> the range of, of music. I, I purposely meant to have as many genres as I could find within one so-called cultural area. Again, the book is focused primarily on communities and peoples who identify as Inuit, both Nupiak and Nupik, as well as Chupik. Um, and so this idea of density within one so-called cultural area was um, purposeful to show the many different ways um, folks sound um, what what Inuitness or Upicity and Cupicity and Inukness means in, in Alaska. And one of the things that uh, really grounds all of this are, are uh, Yupiak ways of knowing, which um, have been written about extensively. Um, Yupiak peoples have, uh, I think, are, are among, the Yupiak and Yupik are among the most uh, have the most fluent speakers to date. And as we know, um, many of our worldviews and philosophies are contained within the languages. And so it was um, a, a real treat to to have studied and, and thought a lot about and alongside and with Yupik philosophers, both um, historic and contemporary. But one of the key quotes that is the epigraph of the book um, is this one from Chief Paul Karangriluk John that says, our ancestors used to say, the world is populated by no one else but relatives. And this idea, again, of when I'm thinking about people's places and projects, peoples, of course, is not just human, that peoples are rock peoples, bird peoples, water peoples, all of the different more than human entities that we all recognize as having souls and consciousness. And so um, that everything is related is, is a, a massive refrain throughout the book. Um, even in these these seemingly with these uh, album covers, there is an assumption that, and for example, when I give these presentations in in different settings that might be outside, well, mostly outside of Native Studies, you know, can you be Yupik and play electric guitars? Can you be uh, Inuit and play um, or, and and do R and B and funk? And of course, the answer is yes. And 
that there's just more um, dense histories and con contextualizations that bring these relations to life and in sound. And one of the main um, theoretical and uh, driving uh, frameworks for the book it comes from Ngaikakaskar Koagli and his Yupiak worldview, A Pathway to Ecology and Spirit. Um, this was a book that I found while I was dissertating, finishing my musicology degree and really catapulted into um, the, the next 10 years that it took to bring this book into being. But that um, within Yurok, the way of the human being, acknowledging that in this model, we're talking about human perspectives or human worldviews that are of course related or interrelated with natural, spiritual and other human realms. But um, that the the kind of rules for, for living a good life, for living a good relation, um, each being of course has their own kind of framework. And this is how uh, Angayakak uh, visualized it uh, in the frame or in the shape of a uh, fish drying rack, uh, a, a shape that we're all very familiar with in terms of the tetrahedral. Um, but in terms of Yurok, um, breaking down the word to yuk, human being and Yurok, the way to be or to live, again, thinking about just human, but human in relation to starting with oneself at the micro level to family, community, and then just mindfulness of, of all of the interrelatedness. Um, it's uh, Yurok is repeated again and again in Kanayurat, oral teachings, that which is spoken. And one of the things that Coagley um, states in, in both of the editions of this book is that this tetrahedral model universe requires constant communication between the three base realms and the human being is a figure, a key figure, but not one who stands apart from or above the elements. And um, that we, again, the idea that every being, every person, peoples has a spirit or soul and that flua, um, which is a word that can mean everything from weather awareness, world, creative force, uh, God or universe and sky is um, also something that uh, all beings with souls have awareness or consciousness. Um, another Yupik contemporary of Angayakuk was Harold Napoleon, who compares Yarak quote to Mosaic law because it governed all aspects of a human being's life. It outlined the protocol for every and any situation that human beings might find themselves in. And so this idea again of uh, the way of the human being being a, a guiding uh, principles for, for living in a good way. And what I wanted to articulate, this is the, the figure that is in chapter four, um, that to me, the dissertation that I wrote was very much focused on the band Bumua, which is one of our most um, well-known Afro-Inuit bands to come out of Alaska, award-winning. Um, and it, as in the dissertation, I centered a lot of that work around um, their intergenerational understandings of not only their identities or the densities of relationality, as I would call them now, um, but also uh, this idea of, of just um, layering and, and the simultaneity of time, space, and past, present, and futures as being um, articulated in this um, rather, this is again, I'm not an artist myself, but a lot of the images that are in the book were actually created by artists, but this one is a, an abstraction of, of the, the mask that you'll see in a second here. But I wanna just very quickly run through a couple of sound examples, um, and then uh, we close with the idea of the densities of relationality. So to kind of sound what this model means, um, takes us through seven different um, recordings of the of the same song uh, pulling from within is how it's also been called or ancient song it's a song that has an over 50 year recorded history and so to me it it, it echoes even though it's in chapter four it draws back in discussions from chapter one in terms of archiving um, inuit music and also um, inuit modes of archiving so the kind of first two chapters of, of the book um, really thinking about um, how those are Inuit-led and indigeneity-centered, not just ethnologists necessarily um, amassing these archives of uh, materials that may have been taken for uh, with or without consent, which of course is, is always um, a question in terms of archival research, right? But then the idea of, of performing and the second two chapters of the book, uh, really thinking about this third version of what contemporary youth um, Alaska Native Heritage Center dancers and those kinds of groups and resurgence 
of uh, Yupik drum dance performance uh, and kind of what happens when when performances, uh, you know, thinking broadly about what's gained and what's lost when things are canonized is an interesting question to me. Um, but then tracks four, five, six, and seven are actually all featured on a double album that Bumya put out in 2012. And so we go from an ethnological recording in the 1960s to um, the first uh, professionally recorded song in 1992. It's being used as a pedagogical tool in 2005 for high school drum groups to then this this double album. And so again, yeah, so we just these are just some separating them out in terms of the one, two, and three as past examples of songs that actually have a presence within these four versions sounded on a double album. So again, this the first sound or song that I just will play short clips of each of them so you have them in your ear, um, is, is, a, is a song that was collected as part of a uh, compilation by Lorraine Caranda in 1966 called Alaskan Eskimo Songs and Stories. And um, I say much more about her in, in chapters one uh, and a little bit in chapter four, but this idea of what's gained and what's lost when things are notated or taken out of context, taken out of communities, um, and the politics of archiving are really, um, you know, questions that I'm, I'm really uh, love to think deeply about. And uh, what we'll do here, though, is just so you can hear the, the first recorded version of Chayungu Gungu, what they call spirit dance song here. just the, the basic melody of this song and here we go and the second song the second recording that um, was made of this was on the first Yupik led professional recording by Chuna McIntyre who actually lives here in California in Sonoma um, and what this album did in 1992 was part of a um, post ANCSA Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act um, resurgence movement of, of Yupik drum dance singing and Chuna led one of the most um, well-regarded Yupik professional drum dance groups, Nunamta, um, of our land, Yupik Eskimo dancers, as he called them. And this this album was one that that shows an interesting switch in terms of what happens when you start performing these pieces for um, audiences and communities outside of the community of origin, right? So he was very much touring on Smithsonian circuits um, and all kinds of other um, uh, encounter kinds of, of models where um, he would need to explain, Chuna would need to explain things in English um, as well as um, performing in, in Yuktun, in the Yupik language. And so a lot of that performance practice of, of slipping the frame of, of explaining things in English is is also modeled here in, in his many different recordings on this album. And you'll hear that in the beginning here with his explanation of what he's calling ancient song. Jai an ancient melody has two words which combines the two mighty rivers of the Yupik world, uh, the Yukon and the Kuskokwim. Ya ya ye nge khia ya ya ye nge khia ngai ye nge nge khe nga ngai and the what he says in the beginning is referring to the two words for the rivers um being uh, the Yupik the Yukon and the Kuskokwim um different dialects of Yupik language so acknowledging the relationality of different communities and how they name things and naming practices in those communities um, is really an interesting point that he brings out here uh, in this piece. And again, as I mentioned, the third version that we have here is um, again used in a pedagogical context in urban anchorage. So these communities that the songs are coming out of where 
the ethnographic recording would have been done in the northern part of Yupik country uh, in, in southwest Alaska. The Chuna's recording, he would have grown up and, and obviously learned those things in, in his village, but then recorded down here in the States in professional recording uh, studio. This next recording is from uh, an urban Anchorage context with the Alaska Native Heritage Center dancers, again, a high school group um, after school program that uh, helps to connect high school age children, uh, students with uh, their different multiple, multiple heritages. There's a, a predominance, as I, I say, explain in the book of, of Yupik and Anupiak uh, song and dance. There's not too much, um, if any, at this time in the early 2000s, um, Dina uh, practices, um, which there are reasons for that. But this song is just an example of how this song might be com performed in community. So very much um, flipping around from what Chuna is doing in presenting to non-Yupik communities. This version is very much how um, people are resurging and revitalizing ways that it would have been done in community. So no English explanations. Um, and very much uh, the form of the song, starting with a solo or a lead singer, followed by the, the rest of the group coming in on the second chorus, which you'll hear in this clip. Yorun una, pinut kamuk, kingunun kartuk. Next four versions are four different uh, versions of the song recorded as the opening and closing track on side A and side B. So tracks 1 and 11 on side A, tracks 1 and 11 on side B for Bum U.S. 2012 album titled Side A, Side B. And um, the mask that you see on the album cover is one that was commissioned specifically by Bum U.S for um, not only this album, but the, the performances around the, the release of the album. And so there were contemporary masks for, um, and I believe I have a picture of them, uh, commissioned for this particular album release. And um, this mask is also the, the basis of the model that, that I showed you in the beginning uh, in terms of um, thinking about um, uh, Yupik ways in particular, but indigenous ways of, of visualizing and explaining the, the kind of music histories and theories that are involved in these works. And so the first version, pulling, uh, what they're calling the song pulling uh, across this album on side A, um, is really more a nod, and side A, I should also say, is um, meant to be more in line with quote unquote traditional performances, so mostly voices in, in chak or drums, and then side B is um, more full band and instrumentation and different genres and grooves, funk uh, world that we'll, we'll talk about in a second too. So this first track, side A, um, track one, side A, is really a nod to um, the different kinds of vocal techniques that Bamya has used over the time. They established uh, as a group in 1996, so by this time, They'd been together for um, almost 20 years at that time. And uh, just thinking about the different kinds of <clears throat> ex extensions and expansions they've gone to just even with the voice um, itself and the centrality of the voice. <laughs> from um, 
different voices and different octaves, but also um, the uh, approximation of, of tube and throat singing and different kinds of vocal techniques that they've used over the years and in their different recordings and performances. The uh, fifth version, or the second version on this album, fifth version overall out of seven, um, features their mother, Marie Arnach Mead, who performed with Chuna and Unamta of our land dancers. And I, I talk more about her in chapter three alongside Chuna and Teresa John as three um, crucial members and, and figures in the resurgence movement of Yupik drum dance. Um, and so they they say in the liner notes them specifically that it's fitting that Marie be featured on this with no drum, just vocals, very much um, hearkening back to Chuna's recording, because in Chuna's uh, professional recording that you heard a moment ago, there was no drum, it was just his voice. But Marie, having learned from Chuna and Marie teaching her sons, uh, Philip and Stephen and Babua, as well as Ossie and Karina, Marie being a, um, a core mentor and, and, and teacher for Bumua as a band, uh, they gave her uh, the last word on side A for this, this track. And the last two Persians that are on side B, track one on side B, uh, is much uh, over the years, Bamua uh, was variously called Yupik Duop, Yupik Soul, um, Tribal Funk, Inuit World, uh, and, in, and now most recently, Inuit Soul, I think is where they've landed um, now in 2022. Um, but this sixth version, or side B track one, is really more um, sounding what they were calling uh, Tribal Funk, right? And in terms of thinking about this um, exciting merging of uh, R&B and funk genres and, and grooves with uh, this song and, and many Yupik language songs are, are, the, are, are the predominant uh, songs that are featured across their albums uh, since 1998. final seventh version track uh, 11 on side b is more uh, gesturing into the future or what they were at that time wanting to reach into in terms of more world musics and and you'll hear that in not only the instrumentation here listed on the uh, white with kora uh, an african um, instrument but also um, just the grooves in terms of uh, what I explain more in depth in the book in terms of being um, Latin-esque, right? And so here's the, the seventh version. <laughs> So 
the idea of the mask and thinking about visualizing native ways of doing music history differently um, again comes from this mask that was um, commissioned by Drew Michael, the Yupik, uh, urban Yupik mask maker, contemporary mask maker and artist. He makes a lot of other beautiful works as well, um, but titled Deep Down and the idea that it's it's using some uh, traditional techniques, but then of course, um, modern materials, like everything from the anchors and the bottom of the mask to um, the hands that are reaching out. And while well, I explain in more depth in the book, the idea behind um, masks and, and dancing, which um, they, from the kind of um, 20th century, um, non-indigenous way of thinking about these things as wall hangings or as you know to be behind glass in a museum couldn't be farther from what the original purpose of masks would have been and, and actually most masks would have been burned after uh, being danced once right that the masks would have been made for a particular song a particular purpose or a ceremony or a happening and um, given given to the to the to the ancestors uh, through usual fire you know a fire a ritual fire but the idea that masks and the appendages that you see here in any way is a form of asking, a form of asking for abundance, a form of asking for um, what a community um, or uh, individuals or families need. Um, and usually, uh, as Bumya even jokes, that a lot of the songs are could be read as menus, right? That we're asking for an abundance of, of, of animals and, and um, sea mammals to, to give themselves so that we can sustain communities for the months and years to come. And in some masks, you will even see um, concentric circles um, around and those being kind of uh, visual representations of different realms, different um, universes, right? So space time as being much different than uh, Western linear senses of time. And so what the um, what the model does, and it's an adaptation of Canadian ethnomusicologist Beth Diamond's Alliance Studies model is really thinking about um, genres and technologies, language and dialect as things that we need to be listening for um, very intently and intensely, listening for the density of these things in musics that might not be readily identified as quote unquote indigenous, right? And that um, there's also the need to pay attention to citations and collaborations, the actual people and, and presences and, and more than human presences that are involved in these songs, um, everything from, uh, you know, the, the musicians themselves, um, the people who they might have learned from in the case of someone like Marie Mead. Uh, or Trina McIntyre, that, that the people and the processes that bring us to a recording, like Bummy was 2012, Side A, Side B, um, is much obviously deeper than just them putting something down on a record. And there, there's also citations um, through different kinds of animal sounds or cries of, of more than human beings and, and peoples. Um, and then also there's issues of access and ownership, again, which becomes uh, a tricky issue when you think about things like the ethnographic recording and how those um, become reclaimed in ways by communities such as the integration on the uh, third version on side A, side B of, of pooling and, and kind of reintegrating that into living, breathing Yupik practice. And so again, the language and dialect, the densities that Chuna points out in his example of how even within the language, it's not just one uh, language under uh, being performed in this case. Um, with the genre and technology, again, if we think about anchoring the ethnographic song, the, the earliest recording as something that um, has in its own way uh, generated different kinds of performances after it, having been um, captured on, on on film or on uh, on tape and so the field recording by the ethnomusicologist um, involved massive figures in the field of ethnomusicology but then reclaimed um, moving to the second version here with Chuna thinking about how um, the the anchor hooks in the bottom of the mask being uh, these traditional uh, performances that were born out of resurgence movement in the 1980s and 90s that then led he led he learned from his grandmother um, and continued to perform with his first professionalized Yupik drum dance group to then the urban anchorage uh, group and high school students who would have been mentored and taught by both Marie Mead um, in Anchorage as well as uh, Philip and Stephen and Ossie in Anchorage to then these kind of three um, quote unquote traditional sounding songs then giving birth to something very different um, from the 
different uh, extended techniques of, of more than Yupik uh, singing techniques of Tuvan singing and even they, they in other performance those they'll they'll throw an in Inuit throat singing as well from Canada what folks might be more familiar with here to um, then paying homage to Marid's presence and Chuna's presence within this whole uh, resurgence project and then also then bringing in um, non-Inuit um, uh, white musicians to put together the tribal funk sound that has been the core, the cornerstone of, of their careers since 1996 um, to talk about relationality and being in good relation with all human beings and that all human beings have tribes is also something that's very much uh, a part of Yupiak philosophy. And so again, this idea, oh, I'm just going to go through this again. Sorry, I'm like advancing through it. Okay, this to the Inuit world music. Um, and to just close with this idea that what had an originally vexed me and, and drove me to um, write the book and do the dissertation and pursue degrees and things like that was this idea that is often um, vexing for those of us that, that do things that might be perceived as modern is this idea that many indigenous practitioners see as a false binary. It's not an either or, it's a both and. That Chuna McIntyre, one of my favorite quotes of his, it's also in the book, is today people call it contemporary Native art, but what they don't realize is that the traditional part is inseparable from the contemporary. We don't pretend to be back there and we don't pretend to be exclusively here. It is a mixture of the two. They are not separate. They are the same. And so in all of these soundings and all of these albums and all of this music um, is just a, a, a demand for people to hear beyond linear um, colonial forms of measure, measurement and containment of who we are and, and what we can sound like and what kind of worlds we want to bring into being. Um, and I think I, I will go ahead and end it there. Um, but yeah, I would love to, to answer or, or have any additional conversation, Leanne, with you or um, let's see, get out of here. Thank you so much. That was that was an amazing presentation. I um, I'm in awe of uh, the rigor of your study and how comprehensive and specific. Um, that's my academic hat. I think on a personal level, I I feel seen as an indigenous musician in a way that I'm not often seen in academic work. And I think that's one of the first times that I've I've felt like that reading your book as well. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to make some space at uh, NASA North Virtual because we have a number of Northern Indigenous performers that are part of our program. Janine Frina Jutli is a Gwich'in sound and performance artist from Old Crow Yukon, and she's um, recorded a performance for us. Uh, Tiffany Ayalik is giving us a. Um, a short of her um, performance tries to remember and that relates to your work so much because she she listened to these recordings um, from her community um, that were recorded in, in 1913 to 1918 in the Canadian Arctic Expedition and notated mm. and uh, transcribed um, by uh, Diamond Jensen mm -hmm. and then um, she based uh, uh, she made a body of work and a performance based on that. And so she's sharing a, a snippet of that with us. Um, Nihilus Holmberg is a Sami musician and poet, and he's uh, given us a performance. And then Leela Gilde is, is ending it. So I've always seen um, Indigenous music and performance and musicians as this rich, rich site of knowledge generation, of uh, world building performances. Um, but I feel like Indigenous studies um, hasn't mm, maybe seen the sort of potential of, of, of that um, in terms of knowledge generation. Mm -hmm. And so I thought your book makes a really interesting and much needed, I think, intervention into Indigenous studies. So what are you hoping that the Indigenous studies readers um, get out of your book? You know, it's, um, thank you for all of that. Um, I'm really excited to see uh, the other performances since we're recording this before. I think they'll be uh, released on, on the Nasa North. But the 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 intervention that I hope and, and that I've I've really felt having worked in the Native Studies Department and, and working with and through folks in NASA for the last 10 years is this idea of um, 
culture, right? That that there's this weirdness around culture as separate from politics or environmental policy and all these things, right? And that I think, um, and as I've read in your work and that I, I know with other um, Native musicians and, and musicologists that that the argument that music is history, music as history, music as medicine, that's really one of the, the important um, arguments that I feel like a lot of us are trying to make. And um, I think you phrased it in one of your books as, as I see your light, right? That I think what initially um, drew me to Bumio was that I, I also felt seen or I felt heard as a, as a jazz musician, as somebody who loved jazz and who was trained in jazz. And I just, I just always had thought, oh, I'm going to be a jazz musician. And then being hit with the reality in both native and, and non-native contexts or in jazz contexts, like what <laughs> what is a, you know, and most people wouldn't even stop to listen and understand to know what the word Denina means or that it's not Eskimo or Inuit, right? And so it's just all of these kinds of things just always congealed around um, the idea of density. And I think we, even within Native studies, there's a great need to to take uh, cultural works, things that have been, you know, parsed as art or music or, you know, everything from basket weaving to rug weaving to all of these things are modes of how we tell our stories and keep our stories, even regalia. Right, that all of these these um, works do work in the world, and so um, I know that's also an argument that Chris Anderson makes in that piece from difference to density, and that's why I feel like it's it's one of the most common refrains throughout the book is this this riff on density and really demanding that we listen for it and acknowledge it and make space for it that um, culture is is you know we tend to think of something like music as an object for contemplation, as my colleague Dylan Robinson states in, in his work on hungry listening. And it's just, it's much more than that. It's, it's a much deeper process that I've also learned through my work and um, working with folks in Greenland around food sovereignty that, you know, there are many people, for instance, who get really up in arms around um, killing seals, right? Like you think about the seal fee and Tanya Tagak and what happened a couple of years ago in the North and, you know, what PETA and other people who are anti-sealing only focus on is the kill moment, not understanding that to get to that moment for many northern communities is a year or more of just cyclical, always getting ready and always um, music and performance being a part of that, offering thanks and, and our intentionality uh, toward wanting to, to not only bring ourselves in a good way to some an entity like a seal, um, but yeah, that it's it's just it's so much deeper than that. And I think the English language and the way that our education systems work is they just kind of want to stop on a representational surface level and just take things for what they see in that moment so they can make a snap. You know, it's capitalism. It has to be quick. It has to be, yeah. you know, now instead of taking the time to do the hard work of really understanding mm -hmm. what what it takes to have an album, what it takes to you know, do any of these kinds of creative works. And and I know, obviously, there are Native and Indigenous Studies scholars doing that, um, but it's interesting how it's not really reflected yet in some of the curriculum that our departments, for example, um, emphasize that um, it's still usually electives or it's something extra instead of maybe like a core um, track that people can actually pursue and so i know that's part of the kind of work i'm i'm trying to change at least in, in uc davis and i know our our particular department's founding had um art and music and, and dance as a core part of it but it's it's kind of 50 plus years later in the discipline at least in the states is, is just kind of trying to reconnect with those roots of what some of our, our disciplines founders knew were important and what our elders know that is important and what we know as creative people is important. So that's a thank you for that question. It's a great one. Yeah, thank you. Um, I When you were talking, I was thinking about that last chapter in your book where you're talking about um, performance as a resurgent world making practice. And I was thinking about those seven um, tracks that you played us and how each time that I heard that song through someone else, through a different body, um, coming into my body, mm. um, how my it was it was rich and it was deepened, 
in that repetition, that aesthetic repetition of revisiting. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering what you, you think of the potential of performance in terms of resurgent world making um, as we're sitting here on the, what seems like the edge of, or the endings of some, some worlds um, and uh, the continual rebuilding of indigenous worlds, I guess. I think about that. I, I just in winter quarter here, we I finished my first version of a, a performance seminar for graduate students. And I really feel like where I got to at the end of that and after the book having come out and having think about what the book means in the world, I, I feel like there's something about performance that reconnects us with other parts of our being that we aren't often asked to connect with, right? I think um, I think a lot with um, Joanne Archibald, Stalo uh, scholar and educator, and her her work, story work. Um, there are some particular models that I really love to use in my teaching, um, but one of them being um, not only the seven principles that she talks about in terms of how we even get to making meaning through stories, and we could say the same as for song work, but this idea of holism, right? That so much of what we ask our students to do in these you know, institutions is always intellectual, always in the mind that we don't necessarily value what they bring in that might be in these other realms that she identifies as. Um, so if her, her book is mind, heart, body, and soul, um, we have the intellectual, the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. And that even those words, you know, when, when some students hear them, um, you know, spiritual might bring up, you know, ideas of Christianity and, and for many Native students like missions or um, residential schools and things, which are still very much resonating in our bodies and our histories through intergenerational traumas. And so I feel like performance and performance studies or thinking about and with and through um, songs and story work and, um, you know, and even like more kind of avant-garde or, or um, uh uh, what is it improvisational kinds of, of performances um things that people might see as out there get us out of the mind they get us into a different part of our being that helps us understand something differently and and hopefully more deeply that i think is really critical to to rebalancing how we move in the world how we relate to each other um how we think about health and wellness even um and, it, and i think that's what's so beautiful about what I know um, of, of what I've learned about what like, Dicinta does in terms of the kinds of work that it does and land-based pedagogies, as you've written about. So, I mean, all of that just seems like something that gets us out of this kind of representational surface, only intellectual or mind-based work um, that, of course, is also based in heteropatriarchy and this idea of, you know, female is the body and men is the mind. And it's just, it's... Um, yeah. There's all kinds of things to unpack there. So I, I see a, an immense uh, potential, obviously, in, in um, performance as, as kind of giving us more tools with which to uh, fight and, and resist these, these settler, settler, colonial, heteropatriarchal capitalist systems that we're all inundated with. Well, thank you so much for this presentation. It's a, a wonderful addition to our program. It's been a it's been wonderful for me to visit with you. I hope that we can do it uh, again in the future in person, on the land somewhere. And uh, I really thank you for this for gifting uh, Indigenous studies and uh, all of our communities this this book um, that just celebrates. I think the creative sovereignty and brilliance of so many uh, Northern Indigenous musicians. So miigwech. Thank you, Chinan, for having me.